Hey everybody, it is Thursday, Thursday at noon, and it is time to write with me. I have a cold. I've been sneezing all day. I might have to blow my nose. Nah. Oh my goodness gracious, I swear, I swear. I'm so sick of being sick, on and off, kind of. Not too bad. I had it really bad in January. Um, but you know what? Fuck it. <laughs> That's all I got to say. So what? So what? It's a cold. It'll go away. Um, mm. ah, so what's everybody up to? Huh? What's going on out there in Facebook land? We're going to talk about flash nonfiction. I am Dawn Z. Manafusco. And I am a life coach for writers. I help men and women over 40 usually. I work with occasionally young those young people. And uh, I help everyone write true stories. So memoir, uh, poetry, essays, articles, manifestos, and flash nonfiction. Flash nonfiction is super cool. It's nice and short for all of our short attention spans. And what have I been up to? So let's see. So I have, before we we get going on this thingamadoodle, I have been discovering that I have um, a kind of a nervous system glitch. Um, people call it anxiety disorder, which, you know, the industry always wants to say that anxiety is manageable, it'll be with you your whole life, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then I discovered two books uh, that actually explain exactly what I've been going through my whole life, which is very different uh, approaches than anyone has ever done in the medical field for nervous system, you know, jitters, anxiety, panic, fear. Uh, usually it's from some kind of trauma when you're younger and could be trauma when you're older, um, any kind of trauma. Trauma is a very interesting subject that most people don't understand. So I've been doing my research and I just thought I want to share these two books that I'm really into right now because I think that for many, many people that don't know about them and I didn't know about them until I really reached out for help uh, and I'm going to share the screen so that you can see what I'm up to reading this week and next week and probably going to study it a bit. So when I share my screen, I think you can see one of them is called the Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind, and Body in the Healing of Trauma. Now, a lot of people, I think, don't realize that they have trauma. I discover it a lot when I'm helping people write true story. So I will start to understand more and more and more about the person and have them go deeper into their story, little bits and pieces here and there, whether it's, you know, recent trauma. I had, a, uh, I had an author who actually... He was on my summit talking. He's very public about it. His name is Harlan Wheeler. And he drove his, I think it was a Hummer, he drove his Hummer onto a highway at night not knowing that there was a car, an elderly couple, stalled with their lights off on the ramp going up and it was pitch dark. So it wasn't his fault. And he hit them. His car went over them. He killed them. And then he woke up in the hospital. And this was later in life. So this wasn't like an early childhood trauma. Well, when I was helping him write his book, you know, uh, which was totally different about, uh, about him going to China and then another book about eventually about how he healed himself. When I started to really talk to him about how significant that event was, I mean, he knew it was a significant event. But when I told him how people really wanted to understand and know you know, the details, not because they were gory, but because they were able to relate to, oh my gosh, I had something like that happen. We all, and, and wow, how did this person, you know, get through it? And that's where true story is so amazing. When we know how to, uh, you know, dive into our own hurt, our own trauma, our own struggles, and we find ways to heal ourselves, we can write about it and heal so many others. So the other book that I'm reading it's called Dare, The New Way to End Anxiety and Stop Panic Attacks. Now, this is a game changer book. This book is changing the entire landscape of the entire industry of psychology and dealing with panic attacks and dealing with anxiety. Now, 
I find that again, a lot of people that are writing true story, a lot of my clients that come to me, they actually hide, they suffer a bit because the stories that they want to talk about do elicit a bit of anxiety or perhaps it was the story that they really want to write about that that has caused them a life of of you know not understanding how to deal with the the racing heart or the the fear that they have um, on and off and I I really think that getting these books are literally I just want you to understand these books are brand new they're from a decade of study and they completely change the landscape of all psychology that has been dealing with anxiety um, and dealing with trauma in the sense that it used to be a life sentence. It used to be, oh, you know, I don't know about you, but I've heard doctors tell me, well, you're going to have your anxiety for the rest of your life. Your mother had anxiety. You were abused as a kid. You grew up in a harsh environment. Sorry, you're programmed for this. It's a done deal. Um, and now I'm realizing what even trauma is. You know, I, I didn't even, sometimes I just think we try to be so tough. We try, oh, I'm fine. I dealt with it already. I saw a psychologist, you know, five or ten years ago. My life is awesome now when it's not. And uh, we, and I hear that from a lot of people, you know, who are truly not doing that great. So when I hear that kind of attitude from people who are suffering and they're not willing to really look at the, what the word trauma means, and it's, there's a definition for it, and, and I won't go into that right now, Maybe I'll have a different show on that. But what I love about edu educating yourself and what I love about these books is these books specifically talk about how you can get back to the pre-physiological body you were before the trauma because your whole physiology changes. And if it's from childhood, you can actually become a whole new person, a person you never even knew you were capable of. So I find that a lot of the true stories when people are doing consults with me, when people are coming to me to ask me about how they should write their story, there's at least 50% of them who are writing about a story that either was a traumatic event or definitely is the, the story itself or the writing itself is causing them to have some kind of a panic uh, disorder or an anxiety disorder. And it really, it's hard to explain unless you read the book, but, but anxiety and panic is actually based on fear of the bodily sensations that you get. So your nervous system is a little tricked out and you can fix that. So I'm excited because now when my writers are having certain episodes of panic, fear, they're talking about trauma, I'm really loving the education that I'm getting and I'm working with some top-notch psychologists and top-notch coaches that also deal with this to help people work their way through. And again, if you find that you've healed from something, then this is the best time to write your true story to get it out there. Okay, enough of that. Let's go on to funny stuff, like my nose. I feel like, I feel like, um, I feel like I should have a red nose and talk about how I'm cute, I'm cute, like uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer does in that, um, and that awesome cartoonish thing that we used to watch when we were kids. So we're going to talk about Flash nonfiction. And I'm not flashing you. Uh -huh. um, okay, so there's this book that I got that I love. And it's they call it Brief Creative Nonfiction. And creative nonfiction, the difference between plain nonfiction and creative nonfiction is creative nonfiction is really similar to prose poetry. And now I've confused you. <laughs> I know I've confused myself. All right. So basically prose poetry, which is like a paragraph and creative nonfiction, which can be long form or short form. So let's just say a paragraph, 500 words or less. We've got, we've got, um, actually, you know what? No, it's right there. Okay, we're going to teach a little. I didn't even think of this earlier. I just thought I would talk about it, but I think it's easier for me to give you a visual. Don't fall. Okay. Here we go. 
Here we go. So, we've got, oh, let's see what we got. So we're going to talk about, today we're talking about flash. I don't like that color. Be done. Ah, okay. We've got flash nonfiction. Which is basically 500 words or less. Okay, so we've got flash nonfiction, which is 500 words or less. Now, flash nonfiction, that's the, this is the 500 words or less. Now, let's go on to the nonfiction part. You could have nonfiction be prose. Prose poetry, poetry, or creative non-fiction. Okay, so you got that. You can barely see that probably, but here we'll make this go down just a little. Okay, so we've got flash non-fiction means it's 500 words or less. And the three ways you can do this is with prose. And I'll give you an example of this. Prose poetry or creative nonfiction. Now, what is creative nonfiction? Creative nonfiction is, an, is a fun uh, question mark that people love to argue about. They love to argue about it. It's so much fun, given that I was top in the debate team in college, or at least mock trial. Um, give me a good debate anytime. But the truth is, is that it's just about anything you want it to be. Everybody's right, usually, in, when it comes to creative nonfiction. So creative nonfiction is when you've just taken some poetic license to change a few things to, to, to better the storyline. Now, you're not, you are actually, in effect, lying. Let's just call it what it is, but they're white lies, right? Little white lies go a long way. Jimmy Carter just talked about that on the Stephen Colbert show. He was talking about how his mother gave him permission to tell little white lies. <laughs> um, you know, like, I really am, it's really my pleasure to meet you, Donald Trump. You know, that would be a, oh, that would be a blatant lie. But um, <laughs> you get what I'm saying. So creative nonfiction is where you might have, oh, I know. I remember one. So I had a woman that knew my family and she used to boil chicken bones and make like um, frames. She used to paint them and make these really cool frames, picture frames. So I made her my great aunt once just to, just to, just to, cause I didn't want to explain how I knew her as a friend and I just was like, oh, she's my great aunt. She comes over sometimes, blah, blah, blah. So that's not necessarily a lie. Uh, I don't really have any great aunts. So, uh, another thing that I did once in a story was, oh, I know. <laughs> once in a story, I was talking about a friend who <laughs> loved it in New York City to play his guitar in the most strange of situations like he'd bring it without he just have it you know without his uh his case on his back and he'd go in the grocery store and he would just start singing about whatever it was hilarious and then sometimes um and this is over the course of months sometimes he would uh play in school in class when nobody was expecting it it was funny uh sometimes he would bust it out at like Oh, at a networking group for one of the business, we were on a business team of selling computers and, you know, in IBM. I was one of the only women to sell IBM in the 80s through NYU. And we'd be sitting there with like all these suits. I, however, had purple hair and leather jacket. I was the punk rock kid who sold IBMs. And so we're in this like midtown Manhattan building and he busts out his guitar in, in a, in a conference room at IBM. So over the course of about four or five years, it was pretty funny that, that these things would happen. But in the story, when I wrote about him and it was a true story, it was, it was my life, it was a snippet of my life growing up in New York. Um, instead of making it four years, 
I condensed his character and said, you know, once a week we would cringe while he picked another spot to, to you know, when we least expected it to embarrass us with another story. And sometimes I, I would, uh, I think in one of them I made up a song that he made about me, and he didn't really actually make that song, but it was to get an idea of his character. So it was a true character. He really did those things, but he did those things over the course of like three or four years. So instead, I condensed it down so that we still got the character, but now we got it, you know, we got like the, uh, the high, the high octane character that made more sense for the short story, true story, creative nonfiction true story that I was telling. So these are the ways that creative nonfiction work. If it's pure nonfiction, uh, then we got to be careful on what you want to present to the reader, right? When it comes to story, though, I think almost all story, given that it's memory, is a sense of creative nonfiction because our memories are not that accurate. I do go over this a bit in the book that I'm writing and really almost done with, so excited, um, called Write Your True Story. And so you'll see that referenced once I get it done. Um, what else? Nonfiction, pure nonfiction, if it's a how-to book, okay? Flash nonfiction. When it says flash nonfiction, we are talking about prose poetry and creative nonfiction. We're not really talking about a quick list of how to. And I'll give you some examples. So what else? Uh, prose poetry. So what is prose poetry? So prose poetry, this great book is called um, by Brenda Miller and Susanna Paola, um, Tell It Slant. Uh, tell It Slant is a quote by Emily Dickinson. And she says, tell your story, but tell it slant. And what that is, is it shows you how you can tell your story, um, but you don't need to tell it exactly how it happened because it's maybe not the most exciting way to tell it. So whether it's a poem, whether it's a uh, creative nonfiction, she goes into a lot of these different, uh, you know, descriptions, but what's a prose poem is, let's see, prose poem speaks to the heart rather than the head. That's the major difference. A prose poem is about what is possible, not necessarily what has already occurred. Even the title, okay, here's a, t here's a title of a prose poem. So I'm going to read you a prose poem. I guess this now counts for the uh, National Poetry Month. Dun, dun, dun. So the prose poem, let's see, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Did she tell me about it and then not tell me about it? That would be annoying. Um, okay, so let's just read what she has here about prose poetry. What is a prose poem? I would turn my face and look into the distance away from our farmhouse into a wild copse of trees which runs from the road's edge and on, and on up the hill to the far fields. Box elder, green ash, and black locust tangle in a net of branches tied together by thorny greenbrier. I know of a coyote den beneath one of the old box elder tree on the edge of a gully cutting through the copse. Copse? If I were to stick my hand into the hole, I could feel cool, wet air and perhaps the playful teeth of pups. So, so she's sort of bringing us in, in a very, you know, in a paragraph, not a, not a poem, but in a paragraph, She's bringing us into this scene and using senses, feels, touch, um, images. So she's really speaking again from the heart. Anyway, so I'm going to read you two uh, very short pieces from this flash nonfiction uh, book called In Short. And then we're going to talk about it a little bit and we're going to write our own. Okay, so, let's see, 18%. This one's called Ice Cream by Susanna Kaysen from In Short. Uh, and this is either, I mean, it's listed as flash nonfiction, so we're going to keep it at that, creative nonfiction. It was a spring day, the sort that gives people hope. All soft winds and delicate smells of warm earth. Suicide weather. Daisy had killed herself the week before. 
They probably thought we needed distraction. Without Daisy, the staff-to-patient ratio was higher than usual. Five patients, three nurses. Down the hill, past the magnolia, already losing its fleshy blossoms, the pink turning brown and rotten along the edge, past the paper-dry daffodils, past the sticky laurel that could crown you or poison you. The nurses were less nervous on the street that day, spring fever making them careless, or perhaps the staff-to-patient ratio was a more comfortable one for them. The floor of the ice cream parlor bothered me. It was black and white checkerboard tile, bigger than supermarket checkerboard. If I looked only at a white square, I would be all right. But it was so hard to ignore the black squares that surrounded the white ones. The contrast got under my skin. I always felt itchy in the ice cream parlor. The floor meant yes, no, this, that, up, down, day, night. All the indecisions and opposites that were bad enough in life without having them spelled out for you on the floor. A new boy was dishing out cones. We approached him in the phalanx. We want eight ice cream cones, said one of the nurses. Okay, he said. He had a friendly pimply face. It took a long time to decide what flavors we wanted. It always did. Peppermint stick, said the Martian's girlfriend. It's just called peppermint, said Georgina. Peppermint dick. Honestly, Georgina was revving up for a complaint. Peppermint clit. The Martian's girlfriend got a nurse nip for that. There were no other takers for peppermint chocolate, was the big favorite. For spring, they had a new flavor, peach melba. I ordered that. You gonna want nuts on those? The new boy asked. We looked at one another. Should we say it? The nurses held their breath. Outside, the birds were singing. I don't think we need them, said Georgina. So what I love about this flash nonfiction and this, you know, piece of creative nonfiction is we really go into the scene, right? She didn't just tell us that she worked at a hospital and a nurse killed herself and they went out for ice cream. They had a few jokes and they came back. She brought us right in there, right into the scene. So I think that's a great example. It's one of my favorites. Um, what else? There was one more that I wanted to... Oh, this is good. Okay. So here's another um, one that could be, again... Prose, poetry, creative nonfiction, but it's flash, meaning it's 500 words or less. And this one is called Sunday by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. White people couldn't cook. Everybody knew that, which made it a puzzle why such an important part of the civil rights movement had to do with integrating restaurants and lunch counters. The food wasn't any good anyway. Principal of the thing, daddy's buddy, Mr. Ozzie Washington would assert, they don't know nothing about seasoning. My Aunt Marguerite would say, I like my food seasoned, she'd add. If there is a key to unlocking the culinary secrets of the Coleman family, it is that a slab of fatback or a cupful of bacon drippings or a couple of ham hocks and a long simmering time are absolutely essential to a well-cooked vegetable. Cook it till it's done, Mama would say. Cook it till it's dead, we learned to say much later. When I first tasted a steamed vegetable, I thought it was raw. The Colemans were serious about their cooking and their eating. There was none of this eating on the run. Meals lasted for hours with lots of good conversation thrown in. The happiest I ever saw my aunts and uncles in the Coleman family was when they'd slowly eat their savory meals, washing everything down with several glasses of iced tea, especially at the family reunion or on Christmas Day up at Big Mom's house. Eating good with plenty of fat and cholesterol was held to be essential to proper health and peace of mind. There were plenty of Coleman's, nine brothers known as the boys, and four sisters, the youngest of whom had died when she was a day or two old. There's enough niggas in your mother's family, Daddy would remark, to cast a Tarzan movie. Sunday in Piedmont was everybody's favorite day, because you could eat yourself silly, starting just after church. Mama didn't go to church on Sundays except to read out her obituaries. She'd cook while we were at Sunday school. Rarely did the menu vary. Fried chicken, mashed potatoes, baked corn, corn pudding, green beans and potatoes with lots of onions and bacon drippings and a hunk of ham, gravy rolls and a salad of iceberg lettuce, fresh tomatoes grown in Uncle Jim's garden, a sliced boiled egg, scallions, and wishbone Italian dressing. We'd eat Mama's Sunday dinners in the middle of the day and keep nibbling for the rest of the afternoon and evening. White people just can't cook good. Aunt Marguerite used to say, that's why they need to hire us. It's a beautiful, 
Beautiful piece of memoir writing. I love that. Like you really get into the family. You get into the culture. You get into where they are. You've got tons of details. You get the story about the big family, the little girl that died at age two, uh, two days old. So I hope you go out and get this. In short, it's a great, great uh, flash nonfiction, flash memoir. I guess it could be called flash memoir, huh? Um, so we're going to try it. We're going to try it today. I would like you... 500 words or less. Let's see, do I have this in here? Oh yeah, there it is. Today's prompt, 500 words or less. Oh my goodness gracious. My, here, let's move this down here. Let's move this over here. Um, and I've got to plug in my, I've got to plug in my computer. Um, 500 words or less. Take a memorable scene or time in your life and write a flash memoir piece. Try not to just tell the scene. Also show us what's happening. 500 words or less. Prose poem or flash nonfiction, which is just a paragraph of prose. So, here we go. It's 1230. Go. We get a half hour. I'm going to shorten it today because I just am. I'm going to shorten it today to, oh, maybe we're going to do 20 minutes. We're going to do 20 minutes, and then I'm going to read. So, everybody, it's 20 minutes. Eh, I'll remind people as they go. What's going on with my hair? <laughs> Everything is backwards. Okay. Doesn't matter. Who cares? Um, so, 20 minutes. And here we go. Ooh, I just thought of something fun.
We've got 10 more minutes left, actually nine more minutes left for those of you that are joining us today.
Five more minutes. Two minutes.
Okay, we're close. 25 seconds. Doesn't look like people are on here today for writing. Hmm, I wonder why. It's okay, you guys will see it on the replay. All I know is that it's cold and dreary out, and this cold is annoying. But I'm glad I'm writing. I love writing. Writing helps everything if you're a writer. <laughs> okay, ta-da! 20 minutes is up, and I'm going to re write, read today's prompt. What I wrote, today's prompt was take a memorable scene or time in your life and write a flash memoir piece. Try not to just tell the scene, also show us what's happening. 500 words or less, prose poem or flash nonfiction, which is just a paragraph of prose. So I did, uh, a, I didn't do just a paragraph. I didn't do more than 500 words. Let's see what my word count, I should have paid attention to that. I just assumed, let's see, my word count is 319 words. And I'll read it to you and then I'll explain a little bit about how I took a little liberties with that creative nonfiction. Okay. You said it would be gone by now. The party ended a week ago, but still I have to deal with Bert fucking Reynolds. I overheard my Aunt Terry say this as she walked into the house with my uncle for Sunday dinner. You're wielding that comb like you're a rock star, but remember, you're from Wisconsin, and you drive an old Ford Escort, and you can't even play an instrument. For God's sakes, Virginia, drop it, Vinny said. You have no respect for my family. Oh, now this is about your family. Uncle Vinny loved his mustache, and as far as I can remember, he's always had it. It was his signature piece, Marlboro Man style. He combed it, shined it, and pet it every chance he got. He even carried around a special mustache comb. He used to tell me it was a special mustache comb that Frank Zappa used, and he pretended he was a big musician that flew back and forth from Hollywood. At seven years old, I believed all of his stories. Sometimes he'd say he just got off the phone with Elvis, and I'd run around in circles screaming because I was such an Elvis fan. Sometimes he'd tell me that he was going to appear on the Donnie and Marie show, and I'd stare at the TV looking for him, only, to, only for him to tell me that his part was can't, cut out until the following month. I figured only stars wore bright blue butterfly collars, bell-bottoms, and rings on every finger. My parents were more subtle in their attire, but Uncle Vinny was lit up. There was something so majestic about his clothes, like they were vibrating over his skin. Little did I know that he was a car salesman, but I remember thinking that perhaps even rock stars have second jobs. <laughs> so that was uh, not about my uncle. That was about a friend of mine's uncle in junior high school. And, and this is her uncle, my experience, but I did some creative nonfiction work for this piece. Um, if I were to put this piece in a, in a book, I would not... Um, claim that all the family members were my family members. You know, I would have, uh, you know, an introduction that explained a little bit about what I was going for in my creative nonfiction. But since this piece was a prompt and I was able to write, you know, a creative, non a creative nonfiction piece and to make it fun in terms of flash nonfiction, I did take all of this from real life and it was super, super fun to write. So, 500 words, what do you got? What kind of flash nonfiction flash memoir piece could you put together in 500 words or less? So much fun. Okay, I'll see you next Thursday. Bye.